It's once again Sunday School. Welcome to Sunday School, everyone. It's a beautiful uh, June, late June morning uh, here in Sacramento. And again, I'm experimenting with uh, my outdoor technology here. I'm in a, in a different section of the, of the yard here. Now, just behind that fence right there uh, is a small narrow alley uh, called uh, Government Alley. And just on the, on the other side of the, the alley is uh, the backyard of the Church of the Cross Lutheran Church, Episcopal Lutheran Church. And they're having, uh, uh, this weekend, having some kind of a uh, festive little event with uh, a dunking pool and things. It's just so absolutely uh, uh, Andy Hardy-ish pleasant. And uh, so if they would, uh, if the Lutherans next door would look across the alley and across this fence, they would see the lawn. <laughs> They would see Lon giving his Sunday school lesson. So uh, I, I hope it's coming through here okay because I, I, it's very, very pleasant. The, the plants that you see around us here, uh, uh, Constance brought them all up from, uh, from Costa Mesa when we moved. We, we had, uh, or friends of ours anyway, hired a special van just for uh, a load of plants because I don't know if you can see them right here but this uh, Christmas cactus uh, uh, thing here came from uh, uh, well it came from Costa Mesa but before Costa Mesa it came from uh, uh, Columbus Nebraska and uh, these plants these same plants came from Constance's grandmother's farmhouse uh, near Richland, uh, Nebraska. And so they've been in the family the, the, entire, uh, the entire time. And there's a couple of sycamore trees that uh, just grew up voluntarily in Costa Mesa. And, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, that we brought up with us, and we're trying to keep them alive. Uh, in uh, it's sort of been a, a climactic shock uh, coming up here, where it's, it freezes at night sometimes and uh, uh, gets up to be 105, 107 degrees uh, in the summertime. But anyway, at the moment, it's a very, very pleasant Sunday. And I'm glad uh, you're, you're joining me for Sunday School. 20 years ago, and I was just reminded uh, this by uh, Ruth Ann uh, Amberston, uh, uh, that 20 years ago, my good friend uh, Mary Greer and I were invited to officiate at the wedding of Ruth Ann and Wald Amberstone in New York. Uh, and in order for me to, uh, usually in California it's, it's easy for me to marry people uh, because California's uh, uh, laws are such that most anyone can marry most anyone in California. But in New York you have to jump through very many legal hoops in order to marry somebody in New, in New York, in New York City. And then you, if you're from out of town or out of state, then you only have uh, the authority to do so for a 24-hour period. But until then, I had to prove all of my credentials, all of my bishop's credentials uh, uh, and my OTO uh, Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica uh, uh, credentials 
and I had to get them notarized and uh, I had to fill out all sorts of paperwork. It was a real, a real challenge, but uh, now I've got that, uh, that, informa that information. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, 20, year, 20 years ago and Ruth uh, Ann uh, uh, posted a picture uh, it was a beautiful s ceremony. They wrote it themselves, and and uh, Mary did one thing, and I did another, and and uh, I was in a, I was like 300 pounds in those days, and I was in a beautiful double-breasted tuxedo, and and uh, anyway, uh, it just brought that uh, brought that to mind. Uh, and it occurred to me that uh, a few years later, uh, they were kind enough to, uh, uh, well, they wrote a beautiful book called uh, uh, The Secret Language of Tarot uh, back in 2008. And once again, uh, they asked Mary to write the, the, the foreword or the the yeah she wrote the foreword and they asked me to write the afterword for the marvelous book and so uh today in in honor of ruth ann and wald amberstone uh i'm going to just read my short little afterword uh, uh to it i mentioned them both also in the song cafe vivaldi uh so, so for a couple of years, every time I visited New York, I, I played at Cafe Vivaldi, which uh, historic, historic Greenwich Village uh, uh, listening room venue. And uh, so one night, uh, it was just loaded with occult friends and tarot friends and OTO friends. And so I wrote a song called At Cafe Vivaldi. And then you can look it up. But anyway, I, I mentioned Ruth Ann and Wald. But anyway, here we go. The Secret Language of Tarot, afterward for the 2008 edition, which was uh, uh, Wiser Books. As a young man, I was introduced to tarot as an adjunct to my study of Rosicrucianism and the Hermetic Kabbalah. It was never my intention to use the cards as a divinatory tool, an activity frowned upon by the mystery school I attended through a correspondence course. And that was B-O-T-A. I say in a digression. Indeed, I was counseled that if I were to use the cards to tell fortune, it would cripple me spiritually. I took my teachers at their word and proceeded for the next three years to use the cards for meditation purposes only. Part of the school's curriculum was the requirement that each student paint his or her own deck of tarot cards. The course provided an unpainted deck of the 22 trumps bearing clean black outlines of the figures on each card and very strict coloring instructions. Each card took two weeks to color, during which time certain texts and meditations were assigned. I must admit, by the end of 44 weeks, I knew every detail of those cards. And that's a fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, idea to uh, painlessly uh, implant every classic detail of every trump in somebody's mind, in the student's mind. It's, it's a brilliant idea. I've recently run across, uh, I'm digressing here, I've recently run across uh, a set of my own uh, tarot of ceremonial magic with just the black outlines of each uh, uh, of each uh, object and uh, 
those I gave to Constance along with the strict coloring instructions uh, uh, to paint. And I'm thinking about seeing if there's any interest enough. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, I could talk somebody into publishing uh, uh, the, the, the blank black and white line drawings of the Tarot of Ceremonial Magic if uh, people are interested in drawing their uh, their own set, but we'll have to see if that ever will come to pass. Okay. I hope I'm broadcasting here, so I don't know. Okay. The mystical powers inherent in the images was apparent from the first weeks of my study. The evening I completed coloring the fool would become one of the most memorable nights of my life. During the night, I experienced the most marvelous vision. It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced, even in the 60s. And that's saying something. It was so intense that even after I woke up and turned on the light, the living images continued to play across the screen of my vision. I won't bore you with the curiously personal details of this nocturnal initiation. It's enough to say that it was an initiation. Not an initiation into the bricks and mortar order that mailed me my monographs each week, but into the temple of tarot itself. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that my two weeks with the fool card had reprogrammed my psyche and triggered a glimpse of a higher consciousness. What would become of me when I finished that whole deck? I thought about that. Now over 30 years, now I could say now over 50 years, tarot continues to play a central role in my life. It's my constant companion. It's perfect Kabbalistic structure and construction is a constant source of wonder and illumination. It is the spyglass counselor and commentator of an examined life. And I view the streaming events of my ever-changing existence as the shuffling, spreading, and reshuffling of the cards. My relationship with the cards has long ago transcended the stage of, oh my, the damn Prince of Cups is beating me up again with the Three of Discs again. The cards have ceased to be metaphoric cartoons of my intellect and reasoning process and have literally become communicating angels of my intuitional life. In the language of tarot, I am moving from the world of swords to the world of cups. And tarot gives me the secret language, the vocabulary to voice such ineffable spiritual subtleties. That is perhaps Tarot's greatest gift to the student of the soul. The ability to communicate with the various parts of our being. To give form and meaning to parts of our psyche that are formless and indefinable the secret language, the gift of the god Thoth. I've long since abandoned my issuing of tarot as a divinatory tool. This, perhaps I, re I read tarot cards quite often. Uh, I'm digressing here. Uh, and for those of you who have uh, uh, had me uh, counsel tarot with you, you know that 
I read in a very unique and personal way, and it's uh, not so much a, a, a predictive experience or a fortune telling or a soothsaying thing, but another kind of experience that that uh, you and I both experience uh, together and ultimately the oracle has to be you. But I digress. I consider my readings for other people to be to be a form of fortune telling Tarot, or indeed any oracle, cannot show us the future or directly answer our question. Tarot is simply a vehicle of perfection, and eternal truth is revealed in perfection. Used with proper intention, such oracles serve to announce the status, not of the future, but of the great now. It's the person who consults the oracle who must somehow glimpse the future or hear the answer to his or her question in that announcement. That being said, I can honestly say that I have never consciously made an important decision based on upon information I have received from the tarot reading, especially my own, or any other form of divination. This is not because I don't have confidence in the wisdom and the efficacy of the oracle, but because I'm a self-centered, self-involved, bull-headed old fool who seldom takes wise advice from any of his friends or family, let alone from a pack of cards or a roll of the dice. I have, however, encountered adepts whose tarot insights are eminently worthy of decision-making counsel. Two of them, in fact, are the authors of this book, Ruth Ann and Wald Amberstone, for which I am proud to pen this brief afterward. The Amberstones are dear friends I officiated at their wedding and directors of one of the most respected tarot schools in the world. Their tarot credentials are impeccable but their greatest qualification to speak with authority on this sacred subject is the fact that they comfortably embody in their lives a conspicuous level of balance, wisdom, and sanity. In short, they're walking examples of lives illuminated through contact and mastery of the secret language of tarot. And uh, that's taken from, uh, I guess this is the last book or the, the last book I published with Weiser a little less than two years ago. Allow me to introduce. Anyway, from the, from the side yard of uh, Rabbit Beaver <laughs> Farm and Reptile Garden in Mudville, California, I'm going to close for, for today and say, Sunday school's dismissed. Both to you and to the Lutherans. And I just see a squirrel. Hello. Yes. I see another squirrel. Yes. No, do you want to be on? Come on. Yeah. Why do, whenever I do that, they, they just climb up a tree. Anyway, until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.